What's going on, brother? Trav, what's going on, man? Oh, man, just busy in the race, man. Busy in the rat race. I was just about to say, would, would that race be the rat race? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. And that means you you're doing, do, man? And that means you're doing some reading over there if you know about the rap race, man. Man, I, I do a little bit here and there. I yeah. try to stay, you know, stay on top of the game. All right. So for those who don't know, the rap race is, is is what? What's that about, man? Man, it's all it's it's just all about. Uh, have you uh, have you read the book uh, Who Moved My Cheese? Is that what? See, I thought it was from Rich Dad Poor Dad. Cause it, I ain't, it is. Oh, okay. I was about it to is, say, I ain't even read I, Who re- Moved My Cheese. Yeah, so I correlated more with that. It's about uh, adapting to change, being able to adapt to change in, 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 uh, in particular in, you know, in the corporate environment and whatnot. All right, so see, we we, yeah. we this this Spartan Dog podcast done started differently. We hey, we got a uh, we got a smart brother on the phone. That's <laughs> <So, laughs> yeah, all good. This one, this one, them been and got his masters or something like that. He's well read. So look, let me yes, back sir. up. So so uh, I I don't stop counting the numbers, but this is the uh, Spartan Dog podcast, and our guest today is Mr. Travis Keys. Travis, what's going on with you, bro? I'm doing well, brother. Good good to hear from you, man. Part of Glad to be a part of uh, this this uh, this process you got going on, man. Informing brothers about the history of Spartan dogs. Yeah, man. I'm trying to. Uh, I mean, you you're one of our blessings, man. Because we we you know we weren't in school together, so like I always say, my my history kind of get flurry after Sean Hart. But we've talked a couple times and and formed a relationship, and it's act like it seemed like we went to school together. So, Trav, you you were were you uh. Where are you living these days, man? Where are you at now? So I currently live in uh, Portage, Michigan, which is just south of Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is about an hour, 15 minutes southwest of East Lansing. Yep, so I live out there uh, with my family. I'm married. I uh, shoot, just hit nine years, uh, August 18th or, or July 18th. And uh, I got three beautiful babies, man. Seven, a middle baby girl just turned five today. And then my sons too. So, so two, two, at, uh, two, two girls and a boy. Two girls and a boy, Gianna, right. Malena, and Mateo. Yep. All right. So, so real quick, man, give us a little, you know, little, 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 little uh, light on the kids, man. State their names, their age, and kind of what they into, man. What what type of personalities they have? Yeah. So Gianna's my oldest. She's seven right now. Uh, she'll be eight in October. She's getting ready to uh, go into the second grade. So that's my. Uh, that's my, she's my leader, man. She's the leader of the tribe. She's my rule follower. You know, she's got that uh, that personality to kind of be in control, which I don't know where she gets that from. Um, you know, she's uh, she's a, she's a, she's just a natural leader, man. She enjoys you know, all types of sports, but her favorite thing to do right now is cooking, man. So we we have her in a bunch of different cooking classes, and so she's trying to sharpen her her skills in that area. Uh, she's just full of love, man. Okay. My uh, my middle girl, my baby girl, Melina, uh, she just turned five today. Uh, so I you know, woke her up early this morning, so happy birthday, and then it hit the highway, hit it into the office. So, um, but she's she's just she's my sensitive one, man. She's really she's got a kind heart. She's extremely sensitive, um, and she just loves to bring a smile to people's face. And when she doesn't. You know, she she takes that to heart. So when you so, say uh, sensitive, is it more sensitive or is she compassionate? I, I would say it's a combination of both. I and mean, she's just really in tune with her feelings and she's in tune with the feelings of people around her. Right. So how she makes other people feel. Um, she's very in tune to that. man, And, it uh, you know, it can it can drive her uh, to a point where she's full of energy and it can it can hamper her sometimes. She can get down if she doesn't feel like she's, you know, making mommy and dad happy and proud or she doesn't feel like she's making, you know, her brother and sister smile, you know, she kind of takes that to heart sometimes. So, right. you know, it's going to be a challenge for us, you know, as parents to, to make sure we channel, uh, you know, all of that the right way as she continues to grow up, man. But you know, she's going to do great things for this world. I can see it. Okay. And then uh, my, my son, my baby boy, he's two. He'll be three in October. Uh, you know, his name's Mateo, but but self-proclaimed 
time, Teo the Tornado. So he, uh, <laughs> you, you, know, you, ask, you ask him what his name is, and he'll tell you right off the bat, Teo the Tornado. So he, so he, te- he tearing up, up some stuff, huh? Tearing stuff up, man. We can't we can't keep him contained. He's, uh, he's all over the place, full of energy, full of passion. He's very aggressive. I mean, it, it's crazy, <laughs> you know, how different, how different the girls are from from the, from our from our from our son, man. But um, you know, he's a boy through and through. He likes to climb on things, jump off of things. He's not scared of anything. He'll you know he'll run up to you and, and try to fight you and wrestle you. You know, he's not he's not afraid or shy to you know engage. With so people. hey, so he 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 the little kid when he go to Chuck E. Cheese, he be beating up Chuck E. Cheese, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he want to yeah, punch Chuck E. Cheese in the stomach and stuff. Yeah, I, you know I hate to admit that because it's a reflection <laughs> of parenting, right? <laughs> but that's that's his personality, man. That's his personality. But he's a good kid, dude. So we're just trying to figure out, you know, how we're going to channel all of that energy moving forward. But he keeps us on our toes. All right, now wifey is 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 it Gia, yep. Giovanna? G- yep. All right, Gio- now Giovanna. All right, so that's a. Yeah. She's a Spartan too, and and y'all met in in high school, man. Yeah, so we met in high school. She's a, she's a Spartan. She's an honorary Spartan. She actually uh, she graduated from Western Michigan, so she's a Bronco. But uh, I, I tell her she gets a Spartan car because she spent more time in East Lansing than she did in Kalamazoo. So, um, you know, we 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 went on and gave her an honorary Spartan car. All right, so all good. She's a uh, yeah. So she's a health educator, man. She taught uh, middle school health for about five years and then uh, she stepped away from that to be a full-time domestic engineer raising our babies <laughs> uh, but since we moved back here in in michigan she uh, reconnected with her professors and some of her mentors over at western and so she's been teaching uh part-time as an adjunct professor over at western for the past three years um, so she's busy doing that she just um enrolled into programming and formed that they wanted to, you know, come on full time. So she just enrolled into the uh into a, a master's of public health program over in Western Michigan right now. So she'll be starting that here in the fall. But yeah, phenomenal woman, man. She's been putting up with me for, for nine years now. I'm going on ten years next next summer. So I gotta I gotta step up to the plate and plan something big for her. Now, on, on, with, with her, Trav, did she she stay at home for all of the kids, or did she just stay home for the last two or one or what? Yeah, so she um, right when we had our first daughter, she she stay, you know she started staying at home. Uh, then we ended up moving from Michigan out to Illinois. My job took me out there, so we were out there for about three years. So she stayed at home the entire time out there, and she had a you know she started her uh, in in home daycare, so started a little business. And then um, once Kellogg brought me back to Michigan, brought us back to Michigan, that's when she reconnected with her professors over at Western. So now she's staying at home for the most part, but she teaches, you know, two or three classes every semester. And it's, it's great because it's flexible with her schedule. So she's typically out, you know, maybe a couple of hours during the day, twice a week. You know, and her, her parents will come over and watch uh, our younger two at that time. And then, you know, her her second or third classes will typically be in the evening that, I'll be home at that point. So we balance it out, man. We make it work. All right, now cool. So then you you kind of mentioned it briefly. So for you, what 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 type of work are you doing these days, man? What are you, what are you working for? We, what, I'm noticing with all the people on the podcast, I always got to say, you know, the, you got to tell me first about the the job with the benefits, and then we all got side hustles. We, you know, we always doing more than one thing. So yeah, let's start with the the main job that allowed your wife to stay home. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No doubt. We would, wouldn't be a dog if we weren't always looking for some opportunities, man. Right. But we, um, so I'm currently uh, a packaging engineer. I work for the Kellogg Company in Battle Creek, Michigan. And so uh, what a packaging engineer does, uh, sorry about that. I had a, had a beat trying to get in on me. Uh, what, what a packaging engineer does or what my field is, you know, entails, we are responsible for uh, designing the packages that our food goes in. So from a structural standpoint, uh, from an aesthetics and utility standpoint, uh, you know, structurally designing our packages to fit whatever uh, consumer uh, need we're trying to meet. Uh, and as well as the, from a chemistry standpoint as well. So making sure we design our packages with materials 
uh, that provide you know, sufficient barrier properties that are necessary to you know, survive the uh, supply chain and, and meet the shelf life requirements. So, Trav, when when y'all do something, this is me out of curiosity from listening to what you what you say you do. So, say like if y'all, you know, design a cereal box, it it. I mean, in my mind, it would seem like well, the cereal box is designed. Do y'all keep kind of breaking it and improving it and and changing it, or you know what I mean? Because there's only so many products, but once y'all come with with something, do y'all are y'all constantly changing it? Yeah, actually, actually, we are. Uh, cereal. I actually work on our snacks business unit, so we do a lot of. Uh, we actually own a lot of brands that you wouldn't even know as Kellogg. So we own like Pringles, we own Cheez It, we own a bunch of different bars, uh, you know, a bunch of different. Uh, snacks and things like that. So, you know, whether it be a salty snack or or, or a sweet snack. Um, but on the cereal front, as you mentioned, that, that packaging format has not necessarily changed from a structural standpoint uh, for years, right? So it's been that traditional bag and box for you know, almost 100 years. Um, so but what the, a lot of the changes and whatnot that they make to that packaging are, uh, you know, more more covert type changes, right? So things that wouldn't necessarily be recognized by the consumer. Right. So maybe changing the, you know, the liner property. So the, you know, the barrier properties and whatnot uh, that's in the, the actual bag that the, the food goes in to either improve, you know, shelf life, you know, as, as our suppliers are evolving and new technologies are coming about, they're figuring out ways to be more efficient with center materials, right? Uh, so just staying in line and keeping all keeping all of our product up, up to speed from that standpoint. But we're also, you know, we're also working on, you know, what's the new age of packaging for cereal, right? right? How do we get cereal out of the box into a bag, right, with some type of recloach feature? So that's, you know, the work like that is being done behind the scenes, although, you know, it's not present currently on the shelf. And this, you know, those are things that, you know, Kellogg and all of our other cereal competitors are working on as well. So, so you, 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 and, you in the grocery store, like I'm listening to the radio, huh? You got a critical eye. You be like, <laughs> no, <laughs> no question about it, man. <laughs> no question about it. I'm always trying to pick up on, you know, what competitors are doing. Not necessarily direct competitors, but even folks that are out in different segments, different markets, um, that are doing you know unique things with their packaging that we may be able to be, that we may be able to may be able to bring over to our uh, to our table. So, so on there, Trav, does that does that? I mean, just from you describing it, it doesn't seem like it gets monotonous and, and boring. I mean, it, it it keeps your your interest or or what? Yeah, no doubt, it definitely keeps my interest, man. I'm uh, I've always been a you know, uh, an innovative thinker. Uh, so being challenged on a daily basis, you know, from that perspective, is definitely something that this uh, that this career delivers for me. Uh, you know, I let me go back and, and give a shout out to the the Michigan State School of Packaging, man. It's uh, it's the number one school in the world for packaging, right? So everywhere you go around the country, around the world, you know to these big, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 200, CPG companies, uh, Michigan State dominates the packaging department. You know, this is, uh, this is where the, where, where the experts have, uh, have grown and where they reside. And, and our school is, the, you know, it's number one in the world, man. It's a very prestigious uh, program. So I wanted to give a shout out to them as well. Now, so that, is that, that's what you did your undergrad and your master's in or what? Yep. So I did my undergrad and my master's, uh, both in packaging at Michigan State. Okay. Cool. Now, what about the other hustles, man, that you got going on, man? <laughs> yeah. So, so from a from a monetary standpoint, my wife and I actually just uh, just started this business, man. We we are both into like woodworking and things like that, uh, building vintage type furniture. My wife more so. Uh, likes to focus on building like different vintage signs and, and more decorative items. I, you know, I like to get my hands dirty and, and dive into the more, you know, the more intricate furniture, larger pieces. Uh, but we have been doing this for, you know, as a hobby for, shoot, since we long, since as long as we've been married. And, uh, you know, we just do things around the house. Um, but I would say within the past 12 months, we've been getting a lot of inquiries from brands and whatnot to, kind of make things, build things for them. We're like, man, we need to 
need to turn this into a business. So we just started a business uh, a couple of months ago it's called Chiave Design. So Chiave is the Italian word for key, which is our last name, and my wife's Italian. And so it made sense. So Chiave Design. So we ba- we just kicked that off a couple of months ago, man. And, uh, you know, we've been getting all types of traction uh, from friends, family, folks that we don't know. Uh, you know, trying to trying to get us to, you know, bring some of our style into their into their homes, man. So it's it's a lot of uh, vintage focus and like farmhouse style uh, for focus decor. So hey, you need, hey, you, you might off, need, man. you might need to get some of your stuff in Coach Baggett's wife shop, man. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. we need to make that connection for sure. Okay, we need to connect make that connection for sure, man. All right, and then but, and, um, and what else you got going on, man? Yep, and so then um, I'm also the co-author of a book, Beyond the Gridiron, How to Successfully Transition into uh, Collegiate Football. So this is a project that I took on uh, with one of our other Spartan dogs, Ashton Henderson. Uh, Ashton's currently uh, a director down in the academic uh, department down at Florida State. So he's over there, uh, football athlete or football academics. And then he also uh, leads a, a, a student athlete leadership program down there as well. And so what Ashton and I did, man, we took, you know, our experiences at Michigan State and we put them on paper, uh, basically setting out to, you know, to provide insight and an advantage to student athletes that aspire to play at the next level, uh, high school student athletes that aspire to play at the next level, uh, as well as preparing, you know, uh, current student athletes that are in college, preparing them and helping them, you know, focus and shift their mindset. Uh, to the right things is going to allow them to see some, you know, some long-term sustainable success after their athletic career. So, so we took a unique approach to it, man. Got away from, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there uh, that's published that's really just focused on statistics and, you know, telling you the odds to do this or do that. You know, we incorporate some of that, but we really try to be real, you know, really personal with it mm-hmm. uh, and just, just speak through our lens and our experience. And just you know, try to provide true, uh, genuine insight to what the student athlete experience is like on the collegiate level, uh, and then incorporated a lot of what we know now uh, as as you know, business professionals, professionals in general, uh, trying to connect the dots back to some of the things that you know we may have done differently or may have thought about differently when we were in college. Uh, just trying to you know give give folks a heads up on uh, you know where the should be to be one of the, the things that's I think that's how I connected with you. I saw you posting stuff about the book, but yeah. one of the, one of the things that I thought that was cool about the book is that you guys focus on one helping kids get into college. But the biggest part that was cool with me is y'all y'all added a sentence was y'all teach them how to get out and how to transition. So it's one thing, exactly. you know, yep. telling the kids this is what you need to do to get ready, but y'all took that extra step of you know talking about transitioning out of college and why, why did y'all add that? And why was that important? No doubt. And it's actually, uh, we, we teetered with changing the title of the book, right? So it says how to successfully transition. But then as we thought that how to successfully transition into collegiate athletics, but as we thought more about it and to your point, our messaging really being focused on the long-term goal, right? The long-term vision as we thought more about it, it's like, okay, we can help folks have the right right mindset as they transition in. If we can set them up for success from the beginning, everything else will take care of itself down the road. So really the key point is making sure they're set up for success on the front end. Right. If you do that, the, the rest of it will be easy. Uh, but it, you know, it's important, for, it's important to us, man, because we, you know, both with, you know, my interaction with, um, uh, you know, the, 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 our Spartan dogs and the athletic department in general, I come across, uh, you know, a lot of student athletes, former student athletes who are, uh, you know, maybe struggling in certain areas of their lives. Ashton, he works with that. He deals with that on a daily basis down at Florida State. Right. And we see how important it is, man, to start, you know, making sure our folks have the tools that they need to be successful and are able to, you know, from a from a visionary standpoint, are able to see beyond just the playing field. And so, uh, you know, I've been blessed to, you know, be successful in transitioning out of sports, you know, like a lot of us have. And, 
know, I feel like I can I can share some of what I know and you know some of the things that I did in order to set myself up in the position that I'm in right now uh, with everyone else that's out there. So. Okay, and then y'all, real quick, the you still deal in the Apex Academy, or can you talk about that? Or yes, sir, yes, sir. And I was getting ready to hit on that next. I was I was getting all of the the income based stuff out of the way first. Now, <laughs> to my <laughs> okay, so to you know to my my true passion, man. Uh, you know we we saying we myself and uh, Caleb Thornhill who was another Spartan dog. Uh, we ventured off on, uh, you know, establishing an organization, establishing establishing an entity that could, you know, impact and give back to our community and help change folks' lives uh, to the extent that, you know, other folks did for us uh, coming up, right? So back in 2010, you know, we had a conversation around, you know, how could we leverage our experiences? How could we leverage the resources and the access uh, to information and, and the access to people uh, that we have? How can we leverage that and, and make a difference, you know, to those who are coming behind? And so from that came uh, this idea of Apex Academy. And what Apex Academy is, we provide, you know, student athletes who come from under-resourced environments, so under-resourced high schools, communities, households. We provide them uh, with resources and access to information that's going to help propel them, um, you know, into college and beyond college into successful careers and, you know, ultimately position them to be you know, productive members of society, right? We understand that, uh, you know, myself, I grew up in, in you know, on the south side of Chicago, uh, Caleb, he grew up in Lansing. He's from the Lansing Public School District, which is where our organization is primarily focused. Uh, we understand, you know, the gaps that existed uh, between students who grew up in our communities uh, compared to students who grew up in other more affluent, uh, res- you know, resource um, communities and environments, and how much of a a push and a struggle it was, you know, for us to bridge that gap and how other folks came into our lives and kind of poured into us and guided us in certain directions to help, you know, help that process as well. So from an academic standpoint, uh, providing them with, you know, tutoring uh, to help, you know, help them enhance basic skills Mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, standardized test prep. So we understand that, you know, the SAT and the the SAT and the ACT, those two standardized tests, as much as I hate them and as much as I hate taking them, those two standardized tests are the gateway in order to get into college, right? So, college so look, real, real quick, you. Trav, you, you said something. So with with, uh, with you as a kid, right? Mm-hmm. So with, yep. with, with, with your, I guess, experience, um, I was talking to Ashton yesterday. You know, I had to do some homework on you, and he said one of the things that he admired most about you was that, the way that you adapt and he was saying as a kid, you know, you moved around like six to eight times. So what, oh, yeah. is, is is that why that's important that, you know, that element, like you saying, you understand it, you understand it because you've been through it or what? Yeah. No, no question about it, man. See, so between kindergarten and the 12th grade, right. I attended 12 different schools and 10 different addresses, lived in four different states, right? And so you know, I moved around a lot as a kid. And, uh, you know, at the time when I was a kid, man, I thought that it was a very unfortunate circumstance that I was dealing with, right? And it wasn't because, you know, my mom was, you know, not doing the right things and, you know, wasn't taking care of us. She was always taking care of us. And a lot of our moving around was her aspiring to give us a better situation, and, you know, that, that we were currently in. Uh, so through that experience, though, you know, as a kid, you got to pick up and you got to move. You got to find new friends, go into a new environment. You know, I thought that was a very unfortunate situation. But what that did for me, man, now looking back, that actually gave me a leg up and allowed me to master the art of transitioning. Right, the master the art of you know stepping into a room, stepping into a new environment, and being able to instantly you know build relationships with people and connect with people you know on another level. And so um, you know through that process, 
in doing that, you know, I was able to, uh, you know, latch on to some folks who kind of saw some things in me that I didn't necessarily see in myself at the time, uh, who began to pour into me and guide me and uh, make sure I had you know, access to information and opportunities that, you know, I wouldn't have otherwise had unless I came across those individuals. So, you know, through just through my experience and, and moving around and whatnot a lot as a child, um, I understand, you know, I understand the dynamics behind, you know, relationships and how important relationships are um, and helping us get to where we want to go. And so I want to be able to provide that for the student athletes that we serve. Uh, the Apex Academy. Okay. And then, so Trav, on, on you, like most of the times I'm, when I've been talking to people, you know, to go to a Big Ten school, these, you know, our colleagues have been highly recruited or had multiple options. Can you talk yeah. about, you know, your last year in, in high school and what options you had or? Yeah, man, it's it's crazy. So, you know, I was, I went to high school. I transitioned. My mom moved us up here to uh, Three Rivers, Michigan, right before high school. Uh, so I went to high school all four years there. Three Rivers is a, a small town just south of Kalamazoo, so it's not a, a hot bed for recruiting at all, right? But I play I played on some man, on some really, really good teams, man, with some really good athletes. And um, you know, I had going into going into my senior year, you know, I wasn't really being highly recruited. I had you know, some, some division two opportunities to play as, some, you know, some division three opportunities to play. Um, but really at that point, my, my focus, I, I got it at an early age, man. And I can't really tell you, you know, the exact formula of, you know, what made me get it, but I understood that, you know, athletics was just a tool. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, you know, as I began to tee up, you know, my options for going to college, I was really just focused on academic piece. And, you know, I had zero Division One opportunities to play. I wasn't recruited at all by any Division One school. And so, you know, going to my senior year, my focus was really just, uh, you know, what is the best engineering program? Uh, what is the best fit? Let me say that. The best fit engineering program around that I wanted to try to latch myself on to, um, and that happened to be Michigan State. Um, you know, so I made the decision to go to Michigan State University, man, and I, you know, being the competitor, being the dog that I am, I, uh, you know, my, my feeling was, you know, if I couldn't play with the best, I really didn't want to play at all. Right. And uh, I was I was okay with that, right? And so I made the decision that I was going to go to Michigan State and I was going to pursue mechanical engineering. And then, you um, you know, I walk on. I try to walk onto the team, and you know, I position myself through some, you know, through some hard work to to be ready for that. And if it if it if it's the right thing for my life, if it's in God's plan, then it'll happen. So um, so 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 that 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 challenging engineer wasn't enough for you, huh? You want to had to go to practice yeah. and run all day and try to major in something for real, huh? <laughs> that that's it, man. And so the way that it planned, the way that it rolled out, man. So I showed up on campus, right? I had no connection with the football program, the athletic. So you you department. wasn't you no. wasn't a preferred walk on or anything. Nothing. Okay. I showed up on campus, right? I checked into my dorms, and then uh, the next morning, I went over to the football office, and I I I walked right into those, you know, walked into the doors over at the Duffy Doherty, and Miss Cindy was sitting at the front desk, all right, and so. Uh, you know, she's like, you know, can I help you? I said, uh, yes, I'm here to speak to Coach Smith, Coach John L. Smith, coach at the time. So I'm here to speak to Coach Smith about, you know, walking onto the football team. And so she's like, uh, you know, sorry, but that's not just how this happens. Right. Uh, in a roundabout way, that's the message that she was giving me. Um, she's like, you know, she talked me through the process. She's like, you know, typically, you know, we have a, an open tryout right before the fall, and we'll have an open tryout in January after the season is over. She's like, uh, but unfortunately, you know, you've missed the opportunity uh, to try out for the fall club, so the next opportunity is going to be in January. And so she's like, you know, I'll, I'll take your name and number down and or your name and your email address down, and I'll, I'll contact you once those dates are set. 
um, and get back to you. So I walked out of that building, man. I was crushed, to right. be honest with you. I was crushed because I'm like, you know, I was so naive. I'm like, man, I had it all planned out. I was going to walk into this building, man. I was going to sit down and talk to Coach Smith and tell him about all my high school accolades, and tell him why he needed to give me an opportunity to play. All right? right? And it got shot down from the beginning. They didn't get a chance to have that conversation. So, you know, my my fate or my athletic, the fate of my athletic career lied in this woman that I've never met before in my life, her actually holding her commitment and getting back to me and responding in January once those dates were set. Mm-hmm. Right. And Miss Cindy is so, still there, right? She's still there, man. Okay. She's still there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have a we have a a, a, a a very very good relationship to this day, man. And it all started from her loyalty in that moment. Okay. So I walked out of that. I was discouraged, man. But at the same time. I'm like, okay, I still got a chance. I wasn't told no. I was just told I gotta, I gotta wait. It's not gonna happen in the time that I thought it was. And so I went on. Um, I was a normal student my first semester in Michigan State, man. I was a normal student. You know, worked out on my own every single day. You know, I was out in the, at the intramural fields, you know, running routes. And, uh, you know, I had a, a, a guy that lived on my dorm floor. He was a punter in high school. He would go out there and kick to them out there catching punts. Every single day I worked out, man. And, you know, I would tell people, you know, they ask me, why are you working out so hard, man? What are you doing? I tell them, you know, I'm going you know, to walk onto the team and you know, I'm going to be a Spartan next year. Right. And everybody would look at me like, dude, you're crazy. <laughs> you know, you're five, five foot nine and three quarters, 175 pounds at the time, 170 pounds probably at the time. Right. Like, man, you're crazy. Oh, uh, but I knew I had it in me, man. And I knew I, you know, at the very least, I owed it to myself to be prepared once that moment came. So fast forward, Miss Cindy hit me back up in January after we came back from Christmas break, man. I, she, you know, she gave me the date. I showed up, man. I said my prayers. And, you know, Coach Manny sat us down and he told us, you know, the statistics behind our odds, you know, the odds of any of us making the team. Right. And, uh, you know, in that moment, dude, I knew that I had to do something to separate myself from everyone else that was in that room, right? And so I, I made it a point. I was very intentional about showcasing my leadership ability in that moment. Because I knew, you know, some of the other athletes that were in that room, I, you know, I played with them, played against them in high school, or I worked out with them, and you know, played some intramural sports with them during that first semester. I knew, you know, we had some athletes. We had a couple of athletes in the in the room. Uh, so I knew I had to do something to separate myself from everyone else. And so I made sure I was the first person in every single line, every drill that we did, right? So that did two things for me. It allowed me to show Coach Manny that I was a leader, right? By going out, you know, I would have to go out and demonstrate the drill full speed and then go get right back in line and then actually execute the drill full speed. So I had to do double the work of everybody else. Right. So, so one, it showed, it allowed me to show Coach Manny that I was a leader, but it also allowed me to get more reps on, because they filmed the whole thing, right? right? It allowed me to get more reps than everybody else. So I'm like, man, you know, I got to give myself an advantage. And so, um, you know, after that process, you know, I got a, I got an email, you know, a couple of days later, Coach Manny wants to meet with you. Basically went down you know, went down to the weight room, man, that with him. And he, you know, my name was the only name on that list out of, you know, 80 plus, you know, aspiring collegiate student athlete really? that uh, went through that workout, man. And, uh, you know, Coach Manny told me, it's like, man, it's, you know, it was more so the way that you led and how you kind of showed up some of the, you know, non athletic characteristics that you displayed on that day that's giving you this opportunity to keep going. And so, uh, you know, that's that's something that I've always carried with me and it's something that I carry with me to this day, man. You know, always, you know, when you're in any type of competitive situation, you got to figure out how to give yourself an advantage for everybody that you're up against. And it's not just about your ability, and, you know, and, and the ability to execute whatever task or whatever skill, uh, you know, that's required for that job, for that opportunity. You got to figure out how to, you know, show people who you really are and how you lead uh, in whatever time, you know, whatever limited time that you have access to them in, you know, you got to make sure that come across because that can be the decision maker right there. 
Now look, so Trav, when, when y'all did that, obviously, obviously, he wasn't in pads or anything. So then you get the call, and then when the when the rest of the team show up, <laughs> I mean, what did you think? Did you felt like you belonged, or did you you was like, man, these dudes some? I remember I got there and Bobby Wilson there, man, they had beards and everything, and I was like, yeah. oh lord. So I mean, at that oh, point, yeah. you made it through the eighty or so people, but now. You you put in a room with the rest of these athletes that's on scholarship and that's been there and all yep. that stuff. So so how was that? Yeah, so Coach Manny told me, you know, that day he's like, listen, this is just the first step. This doesn't guarantee that you're on our team. You still got to go through winter conditioning, which is you know which is start which starts next week. Uh, you know, you, if you make it through winter conditioning, then you, we might invite you back to spring ball. If we do that, you got to prove that. You deserve to be invited back to fall camp. And in fall camp, you, hey, you, hey, you earned your jersey, didn't you? <laughs> no question about it. No question about it. And he, you know, he he laid that map out for me from day one. And so, you know, in my mind again, I'm like, dude, I'm good. All I needed was access, right? right? All I needed was access to this opportunity. That was up to me to do what I've been doing my whole life uh, to go out there and bust my butt, work hard, outwork every man that I'm, you know, in front of to actually get the opportunity. And so, you know, winter conditioning show, you know, winter conditioning comes around. And like you said, I walk in, you got, you know, wide receivers are 6'6", 220 pounds. You got, you know, 220 pound running backs that are six foot two. You know, all of the other DBs, are, you know, 5'11", to 6'2", right? 190, 185 pounds, 200 pounds. It's like, man, okay. But, I never once felt, from a physical standpoint, like, you know, I'm a smaller guy. I never once felt that I was inferior to anybody else out there. Right. Not once. And so, you know, going through weather conditioning, man, I always jumped in the front of the line. I wanted to compete against the fastest or who, you know, who, who at that time, you know, the team considered the best running back, the best receiver, or the best DB, whoever it was. I always made it a point to compete against those folks. And I took pride in beating them. Right. right? I took pride in beating them. And it wasn't it wasn't about, you know, how fast you can run a forty. It wasn't about how strong you were. If you remember those dog days or when in condition, it's about how much heart you got. About will, right? Yeah, it's about will, and I knew that I could outwill anybody that they put in front of me, and that's what I did every single day, man. So, and so Trav, uh, at what point did the coaches even know your name? I mean, when did you start to stick out? <laughs> and so, early on, dude, it was the you know it was the walk on mentality, and a lot of it had to do with just that staff and the mindset that they had. But a lot of it was, you know, you're just a walk on. You never get an opportunity. Uh, you just need to show up, read this card, do what we tell you to do. From the coach's perspective, that's what their mindset was. I gained the trust of the players, man, right off the bat. Once they saw how I approached the game, once they saw, once they saw how I competed, uh, I gained the trust. In, you know, those relationships with the, with the players that was that was quick and safe. And so during practice, man. I would get, this was really my first two years, it would go down like this. I would get cussed out, dude, by the offensive coaches. Cussed yeah, you out. Was all, really you was an all-scout team, huh? That's what they was called? All-scout all team, <laughs> all-American scout team. All-American scout team. Why are you trying to make an impression in practice and leave that yeah. dude alone, let him catch the pass and all that, right? Yeah. Exactly, but I wasn't having it. I'm just, I'm not wired that way. Right. I'm not wired that way. One, I took pride in what I knew my role and responsibility was on the team. And that was to get my guys better, get my guys ready for Saturday, right? And so when I went against the best receiver, when, you know, the starting running back came through that B gap, it was my time to come down here and field. That's what I did. You know what I'm saying? If I had man-to-man coverage or, you know, deep half or quarters, that's what I played. And so if the quarterback threw the ball my way and I could make a play on it, that's what I did. If the receiver came through and I had an opportunity to knock him, you know, knock the snot out of him or go to draw the ball out, that's what I did. Right. You know, if it was a release drill, you know, when all of the other guys would come up and, you know, patty cake with the receivers and, you know, eventually let them off the line, my mindset was, this is Saturday. What you going to do when, you know, Malcolm Jenkins line up across from him? Right. He's not going to let you off the line. 
he gonna try to put you in the dirt. So that's what I did, right? And so after all of you know, after all these all of this time, really two my first two years of uh, you know, getting cussed out and yelled at, eventually the coaches were like, Man, this kid might actually be able to play. And so, you know, going at the fast forward into my junior year, I you know, through that effort I earned you know, spot on the travel squad, I played special teams, you know, that was my reward for all of the, you know, the hard work I was putting out my first two years, but uh, going into, going into my junior year, you know, I started to get some tick and, you know, nickel packages and whatnot, but then uh, about half, about halfway through the season, uh, our starting safety got hurt, and then his backup got hurt the week in practice, and so they're like, oh man, we need a safety we need to find somebody who knows the defense. You know, I knew every single position on the defense in right. and out. So they're like, we need somebody who knows the defense who we can trust. Let's get Travis a shot. Right. So they gave me the nod, man. It was Northwestern game, 2006. Ended up being, from a statistics, from a statistical standpoint, ended up being the best game of my career. Right. Uh, but it also goes down to history, man. It's the greatest comeback in NCAA history, man. We went out to the, to Evanston, we were getting thumped. I mean, thumped, dude, down 28 points. Down 28 points in uh, in the third quarter. Ended up marching back, man. Ended up winning. Got a, you know, I didn't think I finished that game with like 10 tackles, a couple of tackles for loss. I had, I had a, I got the interception that set up the game when the field goal. And, you know, from that point on, man, you know, the rest is history. I think I, I think I, uh, you know, not just within our locker room. I think I opened up some eyes around what I could bring to the table from an athletic standpoint uh, to everybody who was, you know, who was a part of our nation. And, you know, I contributed from that point on. So, Trav, at that point, you still was a walk-on, right? No. Okay. I forgot that part. Yeah, so after my freshman year, uh, my, my first year actually playing, I earned a scholarship that January. So I walked onto the team. January of 2004, so fall of 2004 was my first season plan, and then they gave me a scholarship January of 2005. So on there, how did they? I'm intrigued. How did they do that? They call you in the office. They tell your parents, or you know, nowadays you see them on TV or YouTube where, yeah, they, you know. So how did how did they tell you? Or, or and did you have yeah. any indication before then that it may happen? I had no indication at all. All right. So Coach Smith called me in his office. He's like, you know, this is this uh country playing voice like Travis. Like, you know, you've been busting your butt around here. We got an opportunity and I I believe it had opened up because I think we had some guys who transferred. So it's like, you know, a scholarship opportunity opened up and uh, you know, we did some evaluations and we think we we think you deserve the spot. It's just that simple. Like really? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, came out of the blue. I wasn't expecting it, uh, but man, it was it was a blessing for sure because uh, it took it took some burden off my back, man. Because I had all, while I was studying mechanical engineering, while I was you know playing football, I still worked. I had to work a job, right? Right. So my first really, really my first two years, um, I worked a job every night. I worked for the physical plant. I worked, you know, building maintenance around campus. So from 11, you know, from 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 about 10 to 11 o'clock at night to about 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, I was out working. Still had to be up at 6 o'clock on the line ready to go work out for Coach Manning. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I was grinding, man. So when he gave me that scholarship, man, it took some of that burned off. And then... Uh, Nigga, did you cry? <laughs> I didn't cry in his office, but I cried when I got home, man. Right. I, I called my I called my mom and I called my you know, my girlfriend at the time, Gia, now my wife. Uh called, you know, some of my best friends. I, de- I definitely shed tears for you know, for a couple of days beyond that point. All right. So cool. Now we're gonna move forward and uh it was great stories. I'm intrigued as heck. I can't wait to people hear this. So now it's just I'm really gonna do two more things. One why is it important for you to stay connected to the program? I mean, you played under Coach Smith, but it seems from the outside looking in like you got a good relationship with Coach D'Antonio and the, and the other coaches on the staff. 
So why is it important for you to to stay connected to the program? And it's extremely important. Um, I mentioned to you guys earlier about the importance of relationships, right? And how, uh, you know, folks came into my life and did things for me and gave me information and opportunities, uh, you know, to, to get on a successful trajectory. And I don't know if I necessarily be here sitting in the seat talking to you right now if it weren't for those folks, right? So I understand the power of relationships. And so what I discovered and trying to seek out my purpose, right? The reason that God placed me on this earth, I really feel that it's to, you know, to, to just have a positive impact on people's lives, right? My goal every day that I wake up, whether it be my, you know, my family, my wife, my kids, my extended family, whether it be the, the people that I work with, uh, whether it be the people out in the community, whether it be, you know, Spartan dogs, my purpose is to try to provide people with opportunities and, you know, help them achieve their goals and give them, you know, opportunities and a chance that they may not have had if they didn't come across Travis Key, right? right? So that's, that's, that's the, the, the mark that I want to make on this world, man. And so understanding, I guess it's twofold when it comes to Spartan Athletics, understanding how powerful this game is and how powerful this experience is. If, if we really focus on the right things, you know, how you can be set up with the blueprint to be successful at life. Change your life. So it change your life, man. So I'm very passionate about making sure, you know, our athletes understand that. And then, you know, from a personal perspective, you know, my personal purpose, uh, is trying to be in a position to be a catalyst for people to get to their dreams. Right. At the end of the day, I don't want the credit. I just want people to say, man, I may not be here. If I didn't come across traps, right. that's, that's all. I don't want. I don't want credit. People got to do. You know, you got to put your own work in. Right. Uh, you know, your, your name goes on a on the outside of the building at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, I want to be a part of what helped you get there. All right, and then last too, Trav. I always ask people. So the the term Spartan Dog, man. I mean, what what does that mean to you when you hear it? What what does that evoke? Man. Like I like the hair on my arm stand up when you when you ask that question. Just thinking about that, right? It's just a it's a brotherhood, man. It's a brotherhood and it's a mentality. Uh, first, the mentality is you know, grind, grind. Like you, you do any and everything you need to do, right, to to create a better situation for yourself, for your family, for the people around you. Um, you make the sacrifices. You put in the work. Um, you grind in order to get what you're trying to get, what you're setting out to get. Um, so that mentality of, you know, I'm going to outwork you. I'm going to lace up my bootstraps. And regardless of what's going on, what type of noise is going on outside, what type of doubters and haters are out there um, going against me. You know, Spartan, Spartan dogs, we had that mindset that, you know, we're going to go and take it. We're not going to let other people dictate, you know, what happens with us. And so uh, that, in addition to the brotherhood that, that comes with it, man, when I think about, you know, like we were talking earlier at the beginning of this call, how, you know, we connected, right? Mm-hmm. Just based off of, you know, you come across some posts or some information around our book. And, uh, you know, we started having conversations and instantly. It's like we've been, it's like we've known each other for 30 years. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and to be able to just have that network of people that you can trust that have gone and you know gone and walked the path that you walked um, is is it's amazing on you know to just have that feeling of, of, of brotherhood and camaraderie. You know, it's a combination of those two: the dog mindset and just the opportunity and the brotherhood that comes along with. It. All right. So last thing I'm gonna do is I want to give you some roses. <laughs> is what I say. And um, so my thing was you know like I seen you you know posting. My my thing is I've been you know been working as an entrepreneur since 95, so like 22 years. And I'm big mm-hmm. on supporting people. I'm, I hate people complaining and picking apart stuff. It's like, man, if I see somebody doing something, even if I'm not going to use it, I'm going to buy it. If you call, I'm the sucker. So if anybody listening, if they got kids playing football and they selling cookies and cupcakes and they trying to go on the trip, I'm the person that if they ask me, I'm going to support it. I'm the person 
that any store that I go to, if the if the register, all they have to do is ask me, do you want to donate to this? I say, yeah. I'll be like, who who donated the most or what you want? So I'm that type of person. I just believe in supporting because I know how hard it is to kind of get out there and do things on your own. So for me, when I'm flipping through the little the Spartan Dog Facebook thing and I see two guys working on putting together a book, I'm like, I'm going to buy the book and I need him to sign the book. Now, if I get a chance to read it or whatever, it's about supporting. So it made me feel so good that once I talked to you and it was Ashton, right? Yep. I was like, man, we got people that's smart. <laughs> I mean, you know, like I always like for me in this world, I, I, I promise you, I hate being I hate when people defer to me, per se. Like if we go on vacation, everybody try to look at me to figure out what we're going to do, where we going to go, what trip, what party. And to to sit back and see some young people that just jumped up out there that's just doing it like it wasn't an idea. It was y'all completed the task and got it out there. And then when I talked to you and found out the motivation and why y'all wanted to do it, it just made me feel proud, even though I didn't even know y'all. And right. the, the funny thing, when I talk to different people, they ask me, did I talk to this person? And I'd be like, man, call them. They'd be like, I don't know him. I said, I don't know him either. But, but you exactly. know, we, we got the common bond. And so my thing was, I just want to say congratulations for, you know, for what you guys are doing and just hearing the stories now for the first time of what you went through is, is just like really, I mean, I didn't know the story, right? I didn't even know the story until I started doing homework when I said, I got to talk to you. And, you know, I didn't even ask you a lot of questions because I'm sitting here being a fan and listening through what you went through. You know what I mean? So it, 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 it's a blessing to to be connected and to have that group. And it's an honor to know people like you and Caleb and um, Ashton of what you guys are doing. So like, it's like, man, now I, I called Ashton and he at Florida State, he calls back. And then I see mm-hmm. videos of Caleb working with the Dolphins and it's like, it's a whole different set of groups that just got connected by us talking on the phone. And so, That's you know, it, yeah. And I'm, and then, you know, the same thing, being respectful and being in a marriage, being a great dad, providing the opportunity for your kids to be stable. You are to be commended, my brother. And I'm glad you uh agreed to do the podcast, man. Man, brother, I, I appreciate everything you just said, man. And, um, uh... I appreciate you, you know, for what you're trying to do with this podcast, man, trying to bring awareness, um, you know, and, and, and increase that bond, you know, that we have between each other as far as dogs, bring awareness around each other's stories, uh, find out what we're doing, you know, find out what type of access we have that we don't even know we have through our brotherhood, right? Right. And, and just being able to bridge that gap. Like you said, it just, um, you know, it just takes somebody stepping you know, stepping out and making that connection. You know, we're already connected uh, just through, you know, through Spartan Nation, through, through through the time that we put in on that field. It's about it's just a matter of reaching out and making that verbal or physical connection, man. And, you know, the rest can be history. You know, so I encourage everybody listening to this podcast, everybody listening to, you know, future podcasts or following us on Facebook or whatever it is, um, don't hesitate. Right, don't hesitate to connect with any of us. Um, you know, I can speak for myself in particular. I'm, I'm more than willing to help and do anything that I can, you know, to help a a, a, a soft dog pro- you know, progress. So, whatever I can do to, you know, to make anybody else's life you know, easier, um, I'm, I'm here to do it. So, all right, now, Trav, where where can people follow you at on social media, or you know? Yeah, so you can connect with me on Facebook. Um, Otherwise, you can connect me, connect, connect with me on Twitter uh, at Travis Key. You can connect with me on Twitter via our book Beyond the Gridiron at uh, BTG underscore PPA. You can follow and connect with us uh, in regards to Kiave Design and some of the work that we're doing on Twitter or Instagram. Um, it's just at Kiave Design. Um, Otherwise, you can send me an email, keytravis13 at email.com. And then, uh, you know, we can go from there. You can give me a, you can shoot me a text, give me a call, 269 352 I'll put it out there. You can feel free to call me and, uh, you know, we can connect. All right. Well, cool. Appreciate your time, Trav. We'll talk.
All right, brother. I'll talk to you soon, man. Okay, bet.